The month was September of 1861. It had been just over a month since Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John Baylor of the 2nd Texas Mounted Rifles proclaimed himself military governor of Arizona, effectively overthrowing the already existing provisional government of the Arizona Territory. This rogue territorial government was the group of people who seceded from New Mexico in 1860 and then seceded from the Union in 1861. And this struggling government and its citizen militias had fought the Apaches the whole time before Baylor came riding in and whipped the Yankees in the southeastern part of New Mexico. This left Governor Louis Owings and Lieutenant Governor Ignacio Orantia out of public office. That September, Dr. Owings traveled to Richmond to meet with Congressman-elect Granville Ory and to lobby the Confederate government on behalf of his still unrecognized territory. It was recognized by the Army, but not by Congress. Much to Baylor's chagrin, when he made himself governor, he couldn't just appoint his preferred man, Marcus McWillie, to be Arizona's delegate to Congress. He was bound by the Confederate Constitution to convene an election which Granville Ory won despite Baylor's men canvassing in English and Spanish for his candidate. Marcus McWillie was a well-known lawyer serving as a district judge in Mesilla under the Owings administration, and that's about it. But Granville Ory, the Arizona militia captain, was the hero who led the rescue of the Anglo and Mexican settlers in the Siege of Tubac. And he was a survivor of the 1857 filibuster into Sonora and his older brother William was a survivor of the Alamo. It was no surprise that the hometown war hero won the election. Because he truly believed in the Arizona territorial experiment and knew the Confederate Army would be a precursor to recognition by the civilian authorities, Owings decided not to press the issue. The trip to Richmond was partially successful. The Congress would formally organize the Arizona Territory five months later, but they would not seat Arizona's delegate until that happened. Meanwhile, back in Arizona, Baylor was plotting his next power grab for the upcoming elections. When the Confederate government was formed in February 1861, they scheduled regular congressional elections for December 1861 and 1863. Baylor convened the December 1861 election with only 10 days notice, meaning the incumbent Ory did not have time to get home from Richmond to campaign amongst his constituents. Meanwhile, Baylor stumped hard for McWillie. This time, the Messiah judge won. Granville Ory served a whopping four months as Arizona's delegate to Congress, and the House never even recognized him. After the Confederate Congress passed the law organizing the Arizona Territory, Owings was satisfied that his work in Richmond was complete, and he began making the long train rides back west. The ex-governor happened to be passing through Louisiana when the Yankees pushed their offensive into the Bayou State. As the Federals entered New Mexico and Arizona in the spring of 1862, more Federal troops also entered southern Louisiana, and Owings narrowly escaped New Orleans before it fell to the Federals. However, as Owings was traveling through Texas, the Sibley Brigade, including the remnants of Baylor's military regime, was pushed out of New Mexico and Arizona by the Yankees and by separate attacks from Mexican-American and Apache guerrillas. From that point on, San Antonio, Texas was the closest that Owings would ever get to the territory he once governed and still held close to his heart. The Confederate Congress recognized Baylor's military governorship in January 1862, but they cashiered most of his hand-picked cabinet and replaced them with political appointees more convenient for Richmond than for Baylor. Then in the spring of 1862, while Baylor was away from Arizona to raise more troops, his eight-month dictatorship was ended when he was removed from command due to his infamous Apache order. Before he left Arizona, Baylor gave a standing order to his Texas and Arizona officers that, in order to solve the Confederacy's Apache problem once and for all, Apache bands should be coaxed into army camps under the ruse of peace talks, and then the adults were to be exterminated and the children sold into chattel slavery to offset the costs of the campaign. Then he returned to West Texas with special authorization to raise four regiments of volunteers from West Texas to fight the Apaches and keep the Federals out of Arizona. Taking advantage of his absence, Baylor's critics, including ex-Congressman Granville Ory, made sure that word of this got back to Richmond, and President Jefferson Davis was horrified. Davis countermanded the order and removed Baylor from command of the 2nd Texas Cavalry. The stubborn Indian fighter doubled down on his policy and published newspaper editorials in Texas defending his controversial order. For his insubordination, Colonel Baylor was completely booted out of the Confederate Army. 
pouring salt on open wounds, the ex-Governor Baylor got to read in the newspapers how two separate columns of Union troops from California and Colorado pushed the rebel army back to Texas and erased his legacy from existence. When the shattered remnants of the Confederate Army of New Mexico limped back into West Texas, Sibley reported in writing to General Earl Van Dorn that he had nothing to report other than they defeated the enemy in every battle. Well, technically, yes they did, but wasn't Sibley supposed to be the Confederate military governor of New Mexico? How come he's not in Santa Fe? Once the Confederate Army was completely pushed out of southern New Mexico, General James Carlton, commander of the California Column of Federal Volunteer Troops, declared himself the military governor of the Arizona Territory. This was the first and last time a federal authority would recognize Arizona under its 1860 borders. With the California Volunteers occupying Tucson and Mesilla, the Confederate military government of Arizona was gone from the territory. But the hammer still came down on members of the old provisional government who had not left the territory with the retreating army and rump government. Their provisional government was never recognized by the CSA, but they had still voted as a body to secede from the Union, and they helped raise troops for the Confederate army, so they were still on the hook for treason. Meanwhile, Ex-Confederate Lieutenant Jack Swilling had a very different fate from other Arizona rebels who were getting arrested. Because he deserted from the Confederate Army to avoid being disciplined for stopping fellow troops from looting civilian homes on its retreat from Mesilla to El Paso, he gambled on staying behind and surrendering to the Federals. Swilling promptly switched sides once the Yankees arrived in Mesilla, and he even got a civilian job with the Federal Army as a mail carrier. Presumably, he surrendered, gave the Federals all the intelligence he knew, and took the Union loyalty oath in exchange for parole. Still, it's incredible that the Federals gave this recent rebel officer a job with the U.S. Army. Other things that caught the eyes of Federal officers were even more otherworldly. During the long Federal occupation of Tucson, General Carleton saw a rare ring-shaped meteorite that a local blacksmith was using as an anvil, which absolutely fascinated him. And then he found out the meteorite had a twin. When Carlton found out about the second ring meteorite on Agustin Einsa's ranch, he had both meteorites seized by the army and sent both of them to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. There was no question. The Yankees were in charge of Arizona now. As for Einsa, he's remembered a lot more often for the ring meteorite on his ranch than for translating Arizona's provisional constitution to Spanish in 1860. The great irony for the Arizona pioneers who decided to try their fortunes with the South in order to guarantee an Arizona territory is that, before Carleton's California troops even entered Tucson in May 1862, the U.S. Congress had already passed a bill organizing a new Arizona territory, its border with New Mexico running from north to south, putting Tucson in Arizona and Mesilla in New Mexico to divide the pro-Southern political power that had concentrated in the South. The bill went into effect in 1863. This act of Congress, backed by the federal conquest of the breakaway Arizona Territory, achieved two out of three goals set by the 1860 provisional government. Organization of an Arizona Territory separate from New Mexico, and increased the federal army's presence on the hostile frontier to protect civilians from Apache attacks. The third goal, slavery all the way to the Colorado River, was ironically still legal in Unionist New Mexico, but the federal occupation canceled slavery in the regions that had rebelled, so the Southern Democrats of Arizona shot themselves in the foot in that regard. But it was ultimately a moot point, since the Federals later emancipated Navajo and Apache slaves owned by New Mexico Unionists. And two years later, slavery was finally abolished by the 13th Amendment. Also in 1863, federal troops captured Chief Mangas Coloradas of the Membreño Central Apaches and murdered him in their camp. This made Delgadito the chief of the Chihende Band, and it strengthened Cochise and Geronimo's resolve to keep fighting the white invaders. Although the story of Arizona in the Civil War was far from over, from July 1862 onward, the Confederate Territory of Arizona existed only on paper and in government maps in San Antonio, Texas, and Richmond, Virginia. Other Arizonans who'd stayed behind at first when the California Column entered the territory eventually chose exile. Former Adjutant General of the Arizona Militia, Palatine Robinson, was released from imprisonment late in 1862, but his house in Tucson was taken over by the Federal Army. Hence, he traveled to West Texas and began recruiting for the Confederate Army. 
Even in the spring of 1863, with the rebels exiled for nearly a year, and as the new version of Arizona officially became a U.S. territory, the Confederates kept pretending that their version of Arizona still existed. There was still an Arizona delegate in the Confederate House of Representatives in Richmond drawing a paycheck, and even a rump territorial government in exile, which we'll get to shortly. Both Richmond and San Antonio had big plans for the Far West. The Confederate Army's Department of Texas was building up four regiments of the new Arizona Brigade for an eventual reconquest of the lost rebel territory. Colonel Baylor had started recruiting for this brigade before he was kicked out of the army, and then the task was taken over by Peter Hardiman. These hybrid regiments were raised in Texas and mostly populated by Texans, but they were still organized under the Arizona flag, and they still had a present minority of officers, NCOs, and enlisted men who were from Arizona, and were also peppered with other defectors from New Mexico and California. The designation of 1st Texas Arizona is shorthand for the 1st Texas Cavalry Regiment in the Arizona Brigade. Hence, the 1st Texas Cavalry of Texas and the 1st Texas Cavalry of Arizona were not the same unit, although they worked together many times. The 1st Texas Arizona Cavalry was organized around Dallas County. Captain Peter Hardiman of the 2nd Texas Cavalry of Texas was promoted to commander of the 1st Texas Arizona. This regiment was headquartered first at Victoria and then at Fort Hood near San Antonio. This is not the same Fort Hood as the one in Killeen that we know today, but they were named after the same rebel general. The second Texas Arizona was formed in San Antonio and was commanded by George Baylor, John Baylor's brother, who also served in New Mexico with the ex-governor in 1861 until the Los Angeles Mounted Rifles arrived in Mesilla. The LA Mounted Rifles had successfully escorted Albert Sidney Johnston from Los Angeles to Confederate territory so he could receive his commission in the Texas troops. Then, George Baylor resigned his commission in his brother's regiment, went to Texas, and was recommissioned as one of Johnston's staff officers. After Johnston was killed in the Battle of Shiloh, Baylor returned to Texas to rejoin his old comrades in the recovering Sibley Brigade. In late 1862, Baylor was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and became commander of the 2nd Texas Arizona Cavalry. Another officer who returned to Texas after Johnston's death was Alonzo Ridley, former Undersheriff of Los Angeles and captain of the LA Mounted Rifles. Early in 1863, Ridley was promoted to Major and was made Deputy Commander of the 3rd Texas Arizona. The 3rd Arizona Cavalry's commander was George Madison, former Deputy Sheriff of Tucson. This regiment was primarily composed of white Texans from Burnett, Bell, and San Baba counties, although Company B recruited Anglo-Texans and Tejanos from around San Antonio. However, Philemon Herbert's Arizona Cavalry Battalion served as the scouts for the 3rd Regiment. They were among the few Arizona troops who actually served in Arizona during the Civil War. Finally, the 4th Texas Arizona Cavalry was commanded by Lt. Col. Spruce Baird, the former Attorney General of New Mexico who defected to the Confederacy. Baird's deputy commander was former California State Assemblyman Dan Showalter, who, after he was released from prison at Fort Yuma and forced to take the loyalty oath, made his way to Texas through Mexico in order to join the Arizona Brigade. The 4th Texas Arizona was the problematic regiment. It was recruited from the outlaws, draft dodgers, and border ruffians west of the Pecos River. We can see in this photo of Company D that some of the officers and men do have uniforms, but a lot of the soldiers were in civilian clothes. The lack of uniforms and other supplies was a constant burden for many of the Arizona troops while they were still fighting in Arizona, and clearly the Arizona Brigade was also at the bottom of the Quartermaster Corps' logistical priorities. What makes the Arizona Brigade unique is its different fate from the other famous Confederate brigades, like the Stonewall Brigade in Virginia, or Hood's Texas Brigade, which served and fought together as iconic units throughout the war. The Arizona Brigade, by contrast, was split up for most of its existence, with its four regiments attached to four different brigades. Hence, there was very little esprit de corps among the Texas Arizona troops, except among the soldiers actually from Arizona, including the exiles from New Mexico and California, and this was a pretty small club. Plans to retake Arizona and New Mexico for the Confederacy were put on hold by a series of Union pushes inland, near Texas's eastern border in the spring of 1863. 
These pushes all along the Mississippi River were the precursor to the Siege of Vicksburg and the later Red River Campaign. In the Bayou Tesh Campaign, the Rebel Army had to protect Shreveport, the Confederacy's access to the Mississippi River on both the Texas and Arkansas sides, and maintain control of Texas ports to keep sending and receiving blockade runners. The first combat between the Federals and Arizona Confederates since the New Mexico Campaign happened in Lafourche Parish, Louisiana in the spring of 1863. The Federals had just occupied Brashear City. The 1st Texas Cavalry Brigade under Colonel Thomas Green, a veteran of the New Mexico Campaign and reinforced by the 2nd Texas Arizona Cavalry Regiment, were breathing down the Federals' necks. On June 19th, Brigadier General Albert Stickney in Brashear City received intel from his scouts that the Confederates were advancing toward La Fourche Crossing. Deciding that the city was in no immediate danger, he decided to meet the rebels head-on and personally led troops out of Brashear City to go meet the rebels. They arrived at La Fourche Crossing on the morning of June 20th. Major Sherrod Hunter of the Arizona Cavalry Battalion personally led three companies of the 2nd Texas Arizona as the spearhead of the attack. The 250 Confederate cavalrymen crossed the river in a mosquito fleet of rafts, fishing boats, whatever they could commandeer for the war. When they saw the size of the defending force, Major Hunter reportedly said, We may all be shot. Not one of us may get back to the brigade. But gentlemen, we'd better just fall down in our tracks than go back disgraced and have old Tom Green tell us so. They came out of the tree line and Major Hunter personally led a bayonet charge that took the Union force completely by surprise, and the Arizona troops were able to take multiple Union prisoners. With the Federal troops in battle lines, the Confederate cavalrymen charged, but they were driven back. As the sun went down, the rebels retreated toward the town of Thibodeau. The following day, in the late afternoon, the Texas and Arizona troops made another cavalry charge at Stickney's line in La Fourche Crossing, and once again, the rebels were driven back. They only fell back temporarily this time. At 6.30 p.m., the Confederates returned to the field and started an artillery duel. After 30 minutes of exchanging cannon fire with the Federals, the cavalry charged again. This time, the fight lasted for an hour, although mounting casualties forced the Confederates to retreat a third time. The Federals held the field, but Stickney made a fatal mistake. He had left Brashear City unprotected, and the retreating Texas and Arizona troops got there first and took the city without a shot. One week later, troops from General James Major's 2nd Texas Cavalry, including the 3rd Texas Arizona, fought the Yankees in the Second Battle of Donaldsonville. The 1st and 2nd Texas Cavalry Brigades moved in to attack Fort Butler on the Louisiana side of the Mississippi River in Ascension Parish. The fort was defended by three companies of the 28th Maine Infantry Regiment, some free black militiamen, and two naval gunboats, the USS Winona and the USS Princess Royal. The Confederates surrounded the fort and attacked shortly after midnight. The newly promoted Lieutenant Colonel Alonzo Ridley led his troops from the front in a dismounted charge. The Texans and Arizonans never breached the fort's perimeter. The attacking force got caught in a wide ditch and suffered heavy casualties by artillery fire from the Union gunboats. The Federals held the fort and the city of Donaldsonville. The attack was a disaster. The Rebels lost over 300 casualties compared to just 23 for the Federals. Many of the Arizona troops were captured, including Alonzo Ridley. The captured Arizona officer spent the next two years as a prisoner of war. Three months later, on September 29th, Three regiments of Tom Green's 1st Texas Cavalry Brigade, reinforced by the 2nd and 3rd Texas Arizona Regiments, attacked two battalions from the 19th and 26th Iowa Cavalry Regiments in the Battle of Sterling's Plantation. The 3,000 Rebel cavalrymen completely routed the 650 Federals. Then on November 3rd, Green's division and Arizona regiments surprised and routed the rear guard of General Stephen Burbridge's Army of Kentucky at Bayou Bourbeau. All the while that the 2nd and 3rd Arizona Cavalry Regiments were fighting in Louisiana, the 1st Regiment was on garrison duty in Fort Hood. Meanwhile, the 1st Battalion of the 4th Regiment struggled to recruit new bodies and keep the ones that it had west of the Pecos, while Dan Showalter and the 2nd Battalion were sent to relieve Choctaw and Chickasaw troops at Fort Washita in the Indian Territory. The year 1863 ended with a twist. John Baylor, 
The sacked ex-governor of Arizona was elected to the Confederate House of Representatives for Texas's 5th District. The vengeful Indian fighter was making a comeback. After the Union victory at Vicksburg, the Federals pushed their offensive farther up the Mississippi River along Louisiana's west coast, while also moving up the Red River diagonally across the state, starting from Baton Rouge, to move in on the Confederate state capital at Shreveport. To check this offensive, General Van Dorn deployed the 1st Texas Arizona to strategic points across the Indian Territory, Arkansas, and Northern Texas, while the 2nd and 3rd Texas Arizona regiments were moved to Northern Louisiana and Arkansas. The Arizona Brigade saw combat again in the Battle of Mansfield on April 8, 1864. It was a Pyrrhic victory for the Confederates. Major Philemon Herbert, commander of the original Arizona Cavalry Battalion, was wounded in the cavalry charge, and command of the battalion fell to James Tevis. The rebels captured 1,500 Yankee prisoners in that battle, but at the cost of over 1,000 casualties. That's 12% of Richard Taylor's army lost in one battle. Overnight, Taylor got 4,000 reinforcements, and the next day, the opposing forces fought to a bloody draw in the Battle of Pleasant Hill. The rebels lost 1,200 casualties, and another 400 were captured by Federals, a 14% loss for Taylor's army. The Federals lost a similar amount of men, but the Union could afford those losses, and the Confederacy could not. On April 12th, General Thomas Green was killed in a skirmish at Blair's Landing, so command of the Texas Brigade fell to Xavier Debray. Three months later, Major Herbert died of his wounds from the Battle of Mansfield. His death was a blow to the battalion. Three days later, on April 15th, Union forces occupied Camden, Arkansas. They were deep into enemy territory and their supply lines were stretched, so two days later, Colonel James Williams deployed 1,100 men to forage for food. The next day, April 18th, the Federal Column found their way blocked at Poison Spring by Confederate troops from Texas, Arizona, and the Indian Territory under the command of John Marmaduke. The Federals had run right smack dab into Samuel Maxey's division, which included a brigade of Texans under Colonel Charles DeMorse, including the men of the 1st Texas Arizona and Choctaw and Chickasaw troops of the 2nd Indian Cavalry Brigade under the Anglo-Choctaw Colonel Tandy Walker. Now that they had encountered the enemy, the Confederates took the offensive. Maxey sent the Texans and the natives to charge the Union column, but they were repulsed by heavy gunfire from the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry. The next assault was two-pronged, with both Maxey and Marmaduke hitting the Federal flank. This wave was also repulsed by the Black Union soldiers. However, after an hour, the Yankees were low on ammo and had to ration the last of their shots. The 3rd Confederate assault broke the Union flank and the 1st Kansas Colored had to retreat. The 18th Iowa Infantry tried in vain to set up a second defensive line, but the Rebels had the momentum and the Iowans also crumbled. Confederate Colonel Tandy Walker later recalled, The train fell into our hands, and soon a portion of his artillery, which my troops found concealed in a thicket near the train. I feared here that the train and its components would prove a temptation too strong for these hungry, half-clothed Choctaws, but had no trouble in pressing them forward, for there was that in front and to the left more inviting to them than food or clothing, the blood of their despised enemy. They had met and routed the forces of General Thayer, the ravagers of their country, the despoilers of their homes, and the murderers of their women and children. When the Federals had retreated from the field, the Confederates started summarily executing the black soldiers, while many Choctaw and Chickasaw troops cut off the scalps of the white and black dead alike. The Union forces suffered 301 killed that day, with 182 of them being from the 1st Kansas Colored. A week later, on April 25th, Frederick Steele's federal forces fought Kirby Smith's Missouri and Arkansas troops at the Battle of Jenkins Ferry. In retribution for what happened at Poison Spring, some of the men of the 2nd Kansas Colored started summarily executing wounded Confederates left behind on the battlefield. So at Jenkins Ferry, we decided we weren't taking no rare prisoners, and we didn't leave one of them alive. Meanwhile, 320 miles northwest, the Confederates were maneuvering to block a federal invasion of northern Texas through the Indian Territory. General Richard Gano's division included the 5th Texas Cavalry Regiment, veterans of the New Mexico Campaign, reinforced by several companies from the 1st Texas Arizona. The Texans were joined by Stan Wadey's 1st Indian Cavalry Brigade, which included the 1st and 2nd Cherokee Mounted Rifles, Major Joseph Scales' Cherokee Battalion, 
and Major Broke Arms 1st Osage Battalion. On September 19th, the Texas and Native American Confederates fought the Federals at the Second Battle of Cabin Creek in the Cherokee Nation's land. At 1 o'clock a.m., 1,600 rebel soldiers attacked a 300-man Federal supply train, with the Texans attacking them from the left flank and the Natives hitting them on the right. Although many of the mules ran off, spooked by the gunfire, the Federals managed to hold their ground for five hours, using the cover of darkness to hide their positions. But when the sun rose, their positions were completely visible. Stan Wadey's brigade moved east to capture wagons that had escaped the ambush, while Gano's Texas brigade attacked the Federal flank. By 9 a.m., the Yankees had fallen back in a rout. The Red River Campaign gave the Union some major gains, but they did not achieve all their goals. The Rebels had lost the Mississippi River, but they still had Shreveport, they repelled Federals away from North Texas, and they stubbornly clung to most of the Texas coast. The 4th Texas Arizona wasn't battle ready yet, and stayed in Texas during this campaign. Ironically, this scattering of the Arizona Brigade east of the Mississippi and across several states and territories, and the subsequent series of military setbacks in the war, effectively killed the best chance for the Arizona troops to recapture their namesake territory. The people most in love with the idea of Arizona, and the memory of its heyday, had no idea it was all behind them. Back in Texas, Robert Jocelyn, serving as territorial secretary from abroad since the rebels were actually in Arizona, surprisingly had a small but functional salaried government in exile in San Antonio from late 1862 until mid-1865. It's incredible that he pulled off that alone. Then, late in 1864, after former military governor John Baylor was elected to the Confederate Congress as a representative for Texas, and without Jocelyn giving up his own post as Secretary of the Arizona Territory, Jocelyn appointed himself Acting Governor and also the Indian Commissioner for the Yankee Occupied Territory. Despite having never once set foot in Arizona, Governor Secretary Commissioner Jocelyn boldly submitted a request to the Treasury for all three salaries. Jocelyn's initial request was denied and he was informed he would receive one salary, not two but records show that he ultimately did collect the amount requested. This was most likely because he was a personal friend of Jeff Davis, since they'd served together in the Mexican War, and he had the president intervene in the matter with executive authority. His lifetime friendship with Davis is how he got the secretary appointment in the first place, and if Davis refusing to fire his old war buddy Braxton Bragg is any proof, we know that Davis's loyalty to his personal friends gave him some terrible blind spots. Meanwhile, Marcus McWillie shrewdly lobbied to keep his position as delegate for the Arizona Territory in the Confederate Congress, until the bitter end, 